I've just finished building this frame and before we lock it up and go into the next stage of the build, I wanna make this video and go through all the different components of the frame. We'll go through what everything's called, what the purpose is, and also point out some key differences that I notice in Australia's framing compared to the US frames. Now this is a double story frame that we're in, so I'm just gonna start from the bottom and we'll just go through everything as we make our way up. This here, this is called a bottom plate and this is what all the studs and everything sits on. We frame our walls using 90 mil timber. That's most commonly 90 by 45, sometimes it's 90 by 35. But that's the first comparison from the US. This is 90 mil wide timber and I believe in the US, you're looking at more 140 mil wide. I think the reasoning behind that is in the US, you have a lot more states where you actually get snow. So you need thicker walls so you can have more insulation in there and keep your house warm. Where I'm situated in Australia at least, it's never snowed and there's no chance of snow. So we don't need our walls to be that thick for the extra insulation. We do have a bit of plastic on the outside, which the frame sits on, and that's a termite barrier, which should stop termites entering the frame. Now, moving up from the bottom plate, all these vertical timbers are called studs. And you're gonna find these on all the walls all throughout the house. These in particular, they're called common studs as they are all the same and there's nothing special about them. As we move closer to the window, we've got two studs here and these are called jam studs. Now these jam studs are in place to help hold the weight of the roof above the window. If we look above the window, we've got this thicker bit of timber here and that's called a lintel. Now the lintel sits on one of these studs on either side and its purpose is obviously to hold all of the weight that's above the window and distribute it evenly to a stud on either side. Depending on how wide your window is and how long your lintel is, you're gonna find your lintels in different sizes and types of timber. Now the first type of timber is what you see all around me here, and that's just our normal MGP-10 pine. So this is just a pine lintel here, which is weaker than the alternative, which is an LVL. We can see in the slider here and also the kitchen window, the opening is a lot greater than what we're looking at before and they both have these LVLs above them. Now LVL stands for laminated veneer lumbar and it's actually made out of lots of layers of thin timber that's all been stuck together via adhesive, which is quite weird. You wouldn't think that the strongest beams we find around the work site is just lots of small bits of timber that's just been glued together. But these things are super strong and as you can see, can take the span of this entire roof above the sliding door. Now back at the window, we've got all these small studs below the window. These are all called jack studs and we frame these up to suit whatever size and height the window is. This piece of timber that the window sits on, this is called a window sill. These studs that run down from the top, these are also called jack studs. And the piece of timber running horizontally above the window is called a window ledger. This is another small thing, but I'm gonna make another comparison between this frame and all the frames I see in Australia compared to the US frames. And that is the position of our lintel. In Australia, the way I've done it and every carpenter I know does it the same way. And they have the lintels hard up to this piece of timber here. This timber running the whole way along the top is called your top plate. Whereas in the US, I see the lintels are framed right here where the ledger would be, running right around the top of the window, and then you have your jack studs above it, which go up to the top plate and hold the weight of the roof. Both ways work just as fine. They both hold the weight and distribute that weight to the jack studs on either side. It's just interesting how every frame I see in the US seems to be done one way, and all these Australian frames I see are done the different way. Heading our way back up here, we can see we got a double top plate. This first one I just call the top plate, and the plate above it we call the pitching plate. It's probably a good time to state too that I do go to a lot of construction sites and people do use slightly different terminology everywhere. So what I'm saying right now might not necessarily be correct on your work site. The best thing to do is just work out what everyone you're working with says. Some people have different names and different things. As long as you know what you're talking about, there's no wrong answer. With this double top plate too and the pitching plate, I've always done a double plate. The plans always state if they want a double plate or a single plate. 99% of the time you will have the double plate. What the double plate does is it does distribute the load. If we have a look at this double plate here, we can see the posies holding up the first floor are landing in between both of these studs here. Because it's got a double plate, that's fine and the double plate can actually hold that weight. If I have a choice, I'd always choose to do this double plate, but sometimes you might work for a builder or have an engineer that only wants a single plate. And you can do that, but you just need to make sure you have a stud directly underneath every one of your posies, or if it's upstairs, below every single one of your truss. The stud needs to be at least 100 mil away from your posy or truss. But as you can see above me here, we've got a lot of posies in a close proximity. That's because it's holding a shower above us and that corner behind me would just have heaps of studs and you'd end up using more timber having all these studs than just doing a double pitching plate the entire way through. Now before we jump up to the subfloor, I do want to go back to these walls and talk about some of the bracing elements that we can see. So we start down here, we can see we've got metal straps that come up on some of the studs. So these metal straps are called hoop iron. We get rules of hoop iron and we cut these to length and they do go all the way under the bottom plate 
and come up the stud on both sides. And we just shoot them off with nails and that does help hold the stud to the bottom plate. So all these studs are shot through the bottom of the bottom plate with two nails coming up into them. It is a strong connection, but this is an extra type of connection to help hold the house together. And we do put these in specific locations. This first one here is on one of our jam studs. And the second one, goes at the inside of one of these cross braces. So these cross braces use that same hoop eye material. And as you can see, they just form a cross on the walls. So what we do is we run this cross brace and we wrap it under the bottom plate and over the top plate. And then once it's been shot off to the top plate and bottom plate, we use these things here, which are called tensioners, and we tighten them and it pulls a cross brace until it's really tight. And then we can go through each stud and shoot two nails into it. And what this does is it braces the wall very easily and efficiently, so there's no movement in the wall going the same direction as a cross brace. So whenever we do a cross brace, we try to land the cross brace past one stud, and we always come inside one stud and have a strap at the bottom and also at the top of those studs. For these jam studs, wherever we have a lintel, I always want to have a strap as well, wrapping over the lintel and making sure on the outside it goes down past the lintel and I can shoot it onto the stud and just hold everything together. Wherever you have a strap on the bottom, you want it to be on the exact same stud at the top. In this corner behind me too, we've got ply on the wall on the external side. Now this is another comparison. I do see in the US that all the external walls are sheathed with ply sheets. We don't do that. We don't need a sheet while external walls. There's only certain walls like that corner there which call for these ply sheets and they are used as a bracing element. Depending on the engineering plan, we have a certain requirement on how close we got to nail it off. But you'd see that most commonly on the top plate and bottom plate, we have nails at 50 mil spacings and on the studs, they're about 100 mil apart going the entire way up and around the perimeter of the sheet. They are a lot better, they're a better brace than these cross braces we see, but obviously they do take a lot longer to install as you've got to shoot all these nails off on all the studs. When you are here doing a frame, it's not up to the carpenter to choose if they want to cross brace or ply sheets. All this information is obviously on the plan. The engineer decides all of this, and we just got to follow the plans on where they want the ply brace and where they want the cross brace. Now something else, which is probably the biggest difference between Australia in the US is that we've actually got the windows in the frame already. So in Australia, part of the frame order is to put the windows in as well. You'd have your framers come through and install your windows and no other trades would really start on the house until the framers are done and all the windows are in. I've got no idea what this reason is. It does sound like it'd be a better idea of wrapping the house first and putting the windows in later but it's just something that the Australians do and it's happened on every job I've worked on. So before I did mention that we had pine and LVLs, there's a third type of timber that you see a lot on work sites as well. And both of these jam studs here are made out of it. These are called KD stud, and the KD stands for kiln dry. These are another really strong type of timber, and you do commonly see these in load points where there's a lot of weight coming down on them. For example, here we can see we've got a monster LVL beam. That's a double 400 wide LVL beam. It's holding a lot of weight above it. And to hold that LVL beam up and all the weight, we've got a triple KD stud on the inside here. We're getting pretty close to jumping up to the subfloor and making our way up the house. The last thing I want to talk about is we see a lot of these two are these horizontal pieces of timber between the studs. These are called noggins. Most typically you'd find just a singular row of noggins in the middle of the wall. Now these are crucial. You do need these in your frame and they do hold the studs together and stop the studs bowing in and out and stopping any movement between the studs. So normally you'd only find a single row of noggins in the middle, the center point of your wall. For this frame, we had to double it up. If you have a space between your nogs or between your bottom plate or top plate and your nog, greater than 1350, it requires a second row of noggins. All right, we're gonna start making our way up now and we're gonna focus on the subfloor. So all of these bits of timber with the metal bracing, they're called posies. Now these are something that we don't make in sight. A factory makes them all and they make them all to size and make them to suit each room and each layout for the rooms. And all we do is pick them up and install them. Now if I was to build a subfloor without having a factory build these, instead of using every single one of these posies, we'd be using joists instead, typically LVL joists. And the downside to that is that's gonna cost a lot. These are obviously engineered and rated to hold all the weight from upstairs as well. They're lighter, easier to work with, and a lot cheaper for the homeowner. So we can see there's a few differences on how these posies are connected. This side over here, all the posies are sitting on the wall, and all we need to do for those is get three nails down into the wall. Behind me, we don't have a wall for these posies to sit on. Instead, we've put a big double beam up, and we've had to shoot all these posies into the face of the beam. Now, this is a double LVL beam as well. The difference between a beam and a lintel is a lintel is something that's framed in the studs in the wall, and a beam is something that sits on top of the top plates and sits above a wall. For all these posies that butt into the beam, 
we've put these metal brackets around them. These are called joist hangers and we put these brackets on and they're held on by lots of small nails which are shot through into the beam and also through into the sides of the posies. Another thing we add in are these bits of timber here and these are called strongbacks. As you can see, we got two lines of strongbacks here and we want them to be hard, as hard up as possible to the top cord and shoot them off onto every posy. And what these do is they just eliminate any bounce on these posies. If you walked across a single posy, you'd have a little bit of bounce, but as soon as we put these strong backs in and connect all the posies to each other, it minimizes any bounce, any squeaks that could happen in the future. You can see the posies are really just two bits of timber. These are both 90, 45 bits of timber, and they've got all these steel Vs in them, which help support the weight upstairs. So now that we're upstairs, we can see the flooring that's like down here. This is just a sheet flooring called Yellow Tongue and we cover the entire posies with the sheet flooring and we connect it with a lot of liquid nails and a lot of framing nails. So we can see upstairs all of the framing components are the same for the wall. One thing you might be able to notice for these internal walls is we've only got the single top plate. Now this is what we do for any wall that isn't a low bearing wall which isn't going to be carrying the weight of the roof above us. So we've got an external wall here and that does have that pitching plate which has the trusses sitting straight on top of it. The reason our internal walls don't have that second plate is so that if any of the trusses are going over the wall, the trusses can easily clear it and that they won't sit on that wall. If we have an internal wall that's not made for holding weight and the truss ends up sitting on top of that pitching plate, that new wall is going to become a load point. And if we haven't designed for it to be a load point, it's just going to sag the floor and sag the posies that it sit on, which would also sag the ceiling line downstairs. So a very common framing component that I didn't cover downstairs, it might be a bit easier to see up here, but it's called junctions. These blocks right here, they're called junction blocks and they're in a junction. So you have a junction wherever two walls meet each other. They could look in the form of this, which has a 90 mil space, or like this one next to me, which just has a 45 mil space. And the whole purpose of these is for when the place gets plastered. We'll jump on the other side of this wall and we'll see what they do. So we can see on the other side, this is that first junction we saw, which was a 90 mil gap. And that gap is for where the stud intersects with that wall next to it. So those, block, those blocks that we saw serve two purposes. The first is that they're a good space for a stud on either side to be installed. And now when we hang a sheet of plaster up, we've got a stud on both of the corners where we can screw our plaster sheet into. And the second benefit of these blocks is when we start straightening in our walls, these studs here could have a little bit of a bow in them and it's impossible to get a planer in that junction there. You can't get your planer hard up next to that stud next to it. So what we can do is actually push this in or out to get it straight and then shoot it into those blocks behind it and hold these studs perfectly straight. In saying that, when you do frame your balls out, you do always wanna make sure you put your straight studs in where your junctions are gonna be. So I wanna make a quick note on these straps we have over this LVL lintel. We've got them in the same place that we found them downstairs, which is just over the jam stud that the lintel sits on. Now this is fine because our roof is gonna be a tiled roof. A tiled roof has a lot of weight and it holds the roof down. If this was gonna be a sheeted metal roof, a color bond roof, the bracing elements for this frame would be completely different as that roof is more prone for uplift and actually getting blown away. If this was a color bond roof instead of a tiled roof, we'll need straps every 1800 millimeters, meaning the middle of this beam here would also need a strap wrapping around the top plate and going under the beam. And that's the same for all of our common studs around this frame. Every third stud would need a strap on it to help hold that roof down. So with this internal wall behind me, we can see we've got a cross brace which braces it and stops it moving that way. But to stop it moving in and out, we have these little brackets called owl brackets. So we've got these little right angle brackets up there and their purpose is just to get nailed to the top plate of the wall and then to a nog between the truss and they stop the wall getting pushed in and out that way. So you can see these blue nails here that go into the L bracket. They don't have a single nail hole for the nails to go into. Instead, you can see there's a long cut up and down the bracket for those nails to go into. That's really important for any types of roof, especially a tiled roof. When all the weight of the tiles is on this roof, it is designed and it will sag a little bit. So what those brackets are designed for is when that roof has weight and sags down, those nails have room to move up and down, meaning that that won't turn into a load point and that load won't get transferred to that wall below it. Looking at the top of this wall too, we have these shear blocks up here. So these are found on top of any braced wall and they go in the same direction as a braced wall. We've got a nog going across and then the double blocks that push into the nog. These double blocks aren't shot into the nog, they're only shot up through the bottom of the top plate into the blocks. And since that wall is braced, that wall is not gonna move side to side and those blocks will hold the same position too. And what that is doing is holding the trusses in that same position so that that roof can't move side to side. And once again, we do not want to turn this into a low point. That's why we have the nogs that way and our blocks butting into them and that these blocks aren't actually shot or connected to that nog. So there's no nails or anything that can convert the weight over and turn that into a load point. So we can see this frame above us does have a trust roof. Like the posies downstairs, trusses are also made in a factory and bought out onto site. We don't actually put them together. 
all we do is stand them up and connect everything off. There's a load of bracing elements and different designs for trust roofs and on a lot of frames too you would also find hand pitched rafter roofs which is a lot of fun to build. So there's a lot of different methods to do roofs and there's a lot of different types of trust roofs and even common rafter roofs and hand pitched roofs too. There's way too much to go over in roofing to put it in this video but if you are interested in the process of a trust roof I did put the GoPro on and filmed the entire day that we stood this roof up and you can watch that video here. <laughs> 